I just felt an exhortation to remind you of some people that came before you uh, who weren't all that (laughs) all the time. I think sometimes, especially in our circles, we're waiting for this maturity level, this seal of approval, uh, this thing of being perfect, being fully prepared before we want to go affect anybody else's life. And I want to help you out tonight because um, the devil will always tell you you're not good enough. The enemy will always tell you you have not arrived yet. Um, People will also tell you (laughs) that I don't know why you won't have anything to say. What are you doing laying hands on people? Uh, Who are you? I mean, um, there's all kinds of things that try to hold you in place. But I'm just telling you tonight that the Lord wants to set you free. The Lord wants to get you ready. Because listen, listen up. Uh, We're all he's got. We are the A-team. We're who they call. Y'all remember that show? Anyway, I mean, when they get in trouble, they call the A-team. And we're, we're, we're them. Some of you, you don't understand. Look at it. I don't know. I can't help you. Anyway, so are you ready? Yeah. All right. So in the A-team, I'm Mr. T. Hallelujah. Okay. He was my favorite. Anyway, you know, really seriously, we all just wait till we're all ready. But I want to remind you just real quick of some people. Uh, let's look at some heroes of faith in the old covenant and the new covenant. I just want to remind, I'm just going to go through a list. And this is not to be, um, if they're listening, if they've gathered in the banners, in the bands, not the bandstand, in the grandstand tonight, looking over at Cornerstone, because we got it going on. Um, if they're listening, I, I, I mean no harm to you, okay? But Abraham, well, he was too old. And he, he made some mistakes. And, um, you know, everything wasn't just exactly right. He, even at the beginning, he didn't even fully obey God. God told him to leave everybody behind, and he couldn't leave Lot behind. He took him with him and caused him some trouble. Um, and then... Well, it wasn't all her fault, partly his fault. I mean, he's the one that did with, a, you know, with, the, with Hagar, he did that. And Ishmael, still a problem. You see, but Abraham is known to you and I as what? The father of our faith. Not perfect, but still called the father of your faith. Well, if he's the father of your faith, then Sarah is what? She's the mother of your faith. Because without her, um, there would be no Isaac. But remember Sarah. You you know this one because I talk about it all the time. Because see, I guess for me, I had to look at these people. Because if I was going to do this, then I had to know that I was in good company of imperfect people. You know, just because you see somebody up and doing something or whatever, you think, well, they got it all together and they're all perfect. I would love to tell you I'm all perfect, but you you could ask my wife and she'd tell you I wasn't. I always tell everybody, she's nearly perfect, but I've still got a lot of work to do. And that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that we're bad people. That doesn't mean, but it just means we haven't arrived. None of us have arrived. Amen. And so I, I just want to remind you. So Sarah, what did she do when God said about this time you're going to have a baby and you're going to name him Isaac? What did she do? She laughed. And then what'd she do? She lied. So the mother of our faith is a laugher and a liar and not laughing in the Holy Ghost, laughing at God. And he wasn't real thrilled about it. You laugh. He cornered her on it. He rebuked her. Said you laughed. She said no, I didn't. So then what? She lied. But that's where she started. And then she ended up having Isaac, and she's the mother of our faith. Use that as example in the heroes of faith. Um, Joseph. Well, he didn't start out too good. The big old dreamer. He ended up a slave. He was mistreated. He, he um, I mean, he did everything right, but, but as far as trying to get somewhere in God, it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. As a matter of fact, after he shared his dream, we all thought, well, you should have kept that to yourself. Because he ends up a slave. He ends up in prison. I mean, he's a prisoner. 
Do you know what would happen in the United States of America if someone went from prison one day to totally in charge the next day? You think things are strange around here now. If that would happen, we would all be like, what is going on? What is going on? One day he's a prisoner. The next thing, he is in charge of the most powerful nation on the planet at that time. Amen. Just because it didn't start out good. Moses, he was a stutterer. And, 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 and Moses, don't tell anybody, but he was a murderer. And then he was a runner. Because he was the grandson of Pharaoh. And so he ran. So this great Moses didn't start out so hot. And he ran away. He didn't hide for a day or two. He hid for 40 years. Come on, there's, help for, there's hope for some of you. You've been hiding a long time. We're going to get you out. There's no retiring in God. So he was a murderer, thought he did right. He went to hiding. He stuttered when God called him in the wilderness, and he refused to go alone. God had to send him someone because he refused. He had a burning bush experience, and he refused to obey God. He said, I'm not going alone. So God had to send him somebody. What about Gideon? Dude was a big old coward. He had low self-esteem. He didn't have low self-esteem. He had no self-esteem. And he was the biggest excuse maker of them all. I mean, God had to work with him, what was it, three or four times? Make it wet, make it dry, make it wet, make it dry. <laughs> Isn't it amazing who the Lord is willing to work with? <laughs> oh, then what about David? He was an adulterer, and instead of fessing up, he became a murderer. He didn't just murder anybody. He, mar he murdered one of his mighty men who's been with him since the cave of Adullam. This wasn't just some random dude. And all that happened because the king should have been at war, but instead he was looking over the balcony. And my wife says it this way, you, can, um, you can't sometimes help the first look, but you can help the second stare. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Selah, think on that. What about Elijah? Well, he was suicidal. He said, I'm just going to kill myself. I'm all alone. <laughs> the great fire prophet. Wanted to kill himself. It's a real deal. Serious. He was really seriously contemplating killing himself. Jonah, we know the end of him, but I mean, he ran from God. He went the other way. Got to ride in a whale. That's pretty cool. Can you imagine the stories and the, the pictures of him that they drew? A man who got out with seaweed wrapped around, and he had to stink. I mean, he was the first sushi eater there probably ever was. I don't know. Let's move over to New Covenant. There was a man named Saul. What was he? He, was a, he thought he was so smart, he was so religious. And he thought he was helping God. And he had God's, one of God's best stoned. And he, he stood there and gave consent to it. Everywhere he went, he was putting Christians in prison and having them murdered, having them killed. That's not a good start. Zacchaeus. Well, he put him in there because he was just a wee little man. <laughs> And he climbed up in the sycamore tree. <laughs> Remember? So it doesn't matter what you look like, how tall you are, how short you are, how wide you are, how white you are, how black you are, how Hispanic you are, how Chinese you are, how anything you are. It, it just quit it. 
Just quit it. Just quit it. Because Jesus don't care. And you should quit. A woman who made it into the Bible, she was a five-time divorcee. And Jesus chose to talk to her. And not only had she been divorced five times, the man she was living with, she decided that I'm not going to marry nobody else. And yet Jesus showed her and talked to her, and we teach all of praise and worship off of what he taught her. That's the basis. John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, is, is really the basis of how you teach true worship. What about Mary Magdalene? She's the one who poured oil all over Jesus' feet, and everywhere she goes, she'll be talked about, Jesus said. But, um, man, those people didn't like her because they knew her reputation. If you knew the woman, she's probably a prostitute, had demons. Yet she's remembered, memorialized in the Word of God. Peter, what's up? Love Peter. I would, I, all my friends in high school and stuff, I was this way. I was the let's not get in trouble, let's be sensible, always trying to keep everybody in line. That's, I did, that was who I was. I was the teacher of the group. I, I mean, I was the one, you know, if we're going to do something, I gave them why we shouldn't do this. And so if I would have been around Peter, I'd have been, oh, man, come on, don't say that. Don't say it. Come on. You think that stuff. You don't say that stuff. That's what I would have told him. But we wouldn't have a lot of what we have. But, man, for being assigned to preach the first Pentecostal service, that was just after he denied Jesus three times. This is not a small deal. You know, sometimes we look at it so much. This was a man who walked with the Lord, who in front of everybody there was so afraid of what they thought, he said, I don't know him. I don't know him. And then he cussed, and he said, I don't know him. Now, what about Timothy? He was too young to be a pastor. Yet he was pastoring the largest church in Ephesus at that time. But he was too young. Shouldn't have been doing it. According to people. But see, God doesn't care about that stuff as much as we care about that stuff. He just chooses to. I mean, Lazarus had a big problem. He was dead. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Yet, after he was raised up, I mean, people did get mad and wanted to kill him again because they didn't want his testimony around. I'm just, I, I just, I just want to briefly just encourage you. Listen, all those people that I just talked about, they're real. They're very real. And um, they all had issues. So am I in the right room? Now, we don't need to discuss our, I'm not going to discuss my issues with you. And I don't really need you to discuss your issues. And if you'd like to discuss them among yourself, you can do that later. Uh, but my point is, um, Jesus is the reason that we can do something. Amen. You pull it over into the new covenant. I mean, in the old covenant, they did things too, to, to position themselves. I've been talking about that a lot. You getting positioned for God you know, to bless you, for you to receive from God. Now the Lord really, this is what's so strong in my heart, is he really needs you and I right now more than he's ever needed the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. He needs you to be the minister of reconciliation that he's called you to be. He needs you to speak the word of reconciliation that you know. He needs you as a believer to lay hands on the sick. Yeah, but we're not supposed to touch anybody. He said to lay, believers lay hands on the sick, figure it out. Just try, just do something. 
Follow my lead. I mean, I don't, I, I don't lay hands on the forehead much anymore, but the power of God is the power of God. I mean, uh, when, when Jesus laid hands on Peter's mother-in-law, he just touched her by the hand. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can touch somebody on the shoulder. But, but the doctrine of laying on hands will still work for you today, right in the middle of all this mess. Amen. Amen. You, it, you can even carry a bottle of sanitizer. I don't think the Lord cares. I really do not think he cares. I get people making fun of this, you know, praying with your mask on and having sanitizer. That stuff doesn't bother the Lord as much as it bothers you. And if it really affects your faith, then go dirty and, you know, wear a mask on your forehead. I don't care. I don't care. And I don't think he cares as much as you care. He just, he'll work around it. You put him in a box, he'll break through it. He just will. Come on, he just will. He just will. But I just want to remind you of some things that these people did. But I wanted to give you this. I want to give you, um, I have a few scriptures in my life that really mean something to me. I mean, all the word is good. But I want to give you 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Let's see where I wrote that. Chapter 2. I believe it's verse 8. Can you all put that up? 1 Samuel 2, 8, I believe. Yeah. He raises up the poor or the needy, out of the dust. I was never, and you were never, more poor and needy than when you were not born again or when you were backslidden. See, I'm different than some of you, maybe some of you, which is the best testimony of all, is to be born again at a very young age, filled with the Holy Ghost, water baptized, lived your whole life, went through children, went through kinder church, went through children's church, went through the uh, junior high, went through senior high, went through young adults, got married, you know, all, and, and you still saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll bet you know, there were some issues along the way, but we'll just say, I mean, that's the best testimony of all. We, we should, you know, we like those testimonies where, you know, um, I, I murdered five people and the Lord got me out of prison and, you know, we, we, because we think that that's pretty cool. But really the best and the highest testimony we should strive for and our children should strive for is uh, I made it my whole way amen, and amen. I did it God's way. Yes. Amen. amen. All right. So um, he raises the poor, the needy out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill. Now, I like some modern translation. They try to clean it up. They call it the garbage pile or the ash pile. But it, it, it's literally translated dunghill. And I'm from the farm, and I know what the manure pile is like. And I used to feel like that's where I lived. And the manure pile is where the, the flies gathered. And Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, used to, you know, uh, I used to, man, I, I don't know how, why we lived on a farm. I don't know how I got there, but I was sure glad to get out of there because I was a man born in the wrong place with the wrong people. <laughs> I did not belong there. I did not belong there. And so I, I got out, <laughs> and then the Lord sent me back. <laughs> that made me change my attitude. Hallelujah. But... I know what a, you know, um, if it, I don't think it's much around here, but where I lived in Illinois, there was a whole lot of pig farmers. Oh my gosh. I remember riding this big old yellow bus and back in those days, I don't know if they do it now, but we didn't have no air conditioning and it's hot. And so you got to put down all the windows and you drive through one pig farm after another. And I remember one, it was a huge one. His name, the young guy, his name was Jimmy. And man, we'd pull up and everybody would groan. I mean, I'm telling you, it was awful. It got on your clothes and went home with you. It was gross. And one day we were all fussing and he turned around. He said, all y'all smell is money. (laughs) And he's true because his daddy had some. But we all knew what it was like to grow up around the manure pile. And you never came away from one not smelling like one. But when God lifts you up out of the dunghill, when God lifts you up out of your sin, when God lifts you up out of your problems, 
When God does the lifting up and it's not you just pulling up your bootstraps and trying to be strong, but when the grace of God gets a hold of you, when the mercy of God gets a hold of you, when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, he can pull you up out of a dunghill and then what does he do? And he'll make them to sit among the princes to make them inherit the throne. Oh, I like that one. Make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. I mean, when God picks you up out of the dunghill, when God picks you up, it's like, the, you know, the children, uh, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that came out of the fiery furnace with not even a smell of smoke on them. Right? It's the same thing. That's what you and I need to be right now. Now, I want to talk to you because this is what happens. Sometimes, you know, we get a little crazy and we head back to the manure pile. And if you've ever headed back, thank God he is able and willing to get you out of it. There was a young man. We call him the prodigal son. Right? He got his inheritance. He was the son and he went away and he messed up. And he was in the pig pen in the manure pile, what I'm talking to you about. And he was about to eat some pig food, which was gross. Beyond, if you ever follow, I mean, isolate my ribs. It don't bother me. But if you ever followed a pig around, you would probably not. Because it's nasty. They'll just eat anything. And so if he was willing to do that, but he came to himself. I believe in the hour that we live in, even though we've been through a mess for a year, I believe people are going to start awakening unto righteousness. I believe people are going to start waking up. Their eyes of their understanding are going to be enlightened. Hallelujah. The blinders are going to come off of their eyes. They're going to be, what, 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 I've, been, what I've been doing? What I've been doing? What I've been doing? Come on. Some of you, your adult children are going to come home. They're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Your friends and your family uh, that, that have walked away from God, they're going to come back to God. Hallelujah. I said they're going to come back to God. Because it's an hour of restitution. It's an hour of restoring. And what God does is he picks us up from the dunghill and sets us among his people. So let's look at the other one. It's a, sim it's a similar, but I want to see that in Psalms. Psalms 1. Oh, I lost it now. 113.7. Psalms 113, it says the same thing, but I, want, but I want you to see this because I really believe the Lord wants to do this with you. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the dunghill. I'm just feeling, what, when I went home today, when I was in the car, because I didn't have anything for tonight, and I was like, ooh, you know, um, that, especially second service, we, I had him do that song, um, I Thank God, because it was just here in the room. And uh, I was like, ooh, that's good. And then I just heard the word, um, Restore, and then I tried to take a nap and couldn't because really just kind of excited about what's going on around here. And uh, the Lord just deal with me. And He said, uh, Up out of the dunghill. Come on, y'all. The Lord wants to use you. He, has He delivered you up out of the dunghill? Has He set you among His princes? Come on, have you inherited the throne of glory? Then it's time to let it. Come on, it's time. It's time. You know, the great thing about getting others out of the dunghill, you can go down and pull them up. By the help of the Holy Ghost, and it won't get on you. Amen. It doesn't have to get on you. Right. You can restore them. Galatians 6 1. I, we got to understand they're in sin. The Bible says they're in sin. They're in sin. Listen, if you love somebody, you wouldn't leave them in sin. Amen. I said, if you really love somebody, you wouldn't tell them their sin is okay. That's right. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't agree with them. You don't, listen to me, I'm talking to somebody. You don't love them like you think you do. If you're, the wages of sin is always death. And for you to wink and nod at their sin, knowing it's sin, you don't love them. Well, Pastor Mark, you know, don't get so strong. We were having fun. But their lives are on the line. And I don't know them. You do. I don't work with them. You do. I don't eat Thanksgiving dinner with them. You do. Well, they just don't want to hear anything. Well, be led by the Holy Ghost. I know sometimes I said that Thanksgiving, y'all went, oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> My family won't listen to nothing I say. I get it, but they're watching your lives. 
I got to be real careful. Hey, family. <laughs> it's because uh, they used to not be watching. Now they're watching. Um, but I had some, some family, not, not those of you who are watching. <laughs> Love you. Um, <laughs> the other ones. Is it hot in here? <laughs> I used to hear things like this. He's got a demon. He's in a cult. Huh? Aimed at me. Talking about my family, talking about me. He's lost his mind. He's hurting people. Tell him it's the will of God to heal everybody. He's hurting people. God's going to get him. Get them. Talking about us. But when they need something, call Mark. Have him pray. I find that an honor and a privilege. And I will. Because God hears me when I pray. God hears you when you pray. Amen. And then they'll start trickling in. Hey, cousin. <laughs> they'll start trickling in. And then other cousins are going to start trickling in. Hallelujah. Got some second cousins watching. If you don't want me to know you're watching, watch on something besides Facebook. Because they tell me. Mm. Uh -uh. I'm glad. Y'all. The Lord wants to use you. Not me because I'm a preacher. If I wasn't a preacher, I, I would hope that he'd use me. I was letting the Lord use me when... You all weren't here, and I wasn't even sure I was going to be a preacher. He can use you to lay hands on the sick. It doesn't really matter how you started. It matters how you finish. And even if along the way, if you made some mistakes or gotten into sin, and I understand, you know, we're talking on Sunday mornings about the wiles of the devil, the devices of the devil. He's real, and he's mean, and he's nasty. But you've been given a name that's above every name. And there's no sin that comes your way that you're not able to resist it. Come on, the grace of God is there. There's no sickness and disease that has to take you out. But if it does, the worst thing that happens is you go to heaven. But it doesn't have to take you out early. Amen. Oh, what are we talking about? Well, we're just talking about the fact that the Lord needs you. He needs you more than ever. We're getting ready to come out of the wilderness. And we're coming out in power and demonstration. And I just wanted to remind you that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. Now, am I advocating just live any old way you want? Because the Lord will just use you anyway. No, that's just not true. Um, the grace that he's given us causes us not to sin. If you live in sin, you're going to deal with some sort of death. Not necessarily physical death, but you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna wander into something that's going to cause an end to something. Could cause an end of a marriage. Could cause the end of a job. Could cause the end of a career. Could cause the end of a business could cause the end of relationships. So the wages of sin is always death of some sort. And so we don't want to participate. All I'm saying is, if you were like any of those people I talked about, you aren't perfect. That's right. Amen. And yet they weren't perfect, and God used them anyway. Now, some of them had to do some things to adjust. And so, I, you know, I don't know how many to look at, um, but... Let's look at this. We pick on Sarah a lot. She's a laugher and a liar. But pick, uh, let's look at Hebrews 11.11. 11. 
Hebrews 11, 11. Through faith, also Sarah herself. Because see, it wasn't just Abram. Through faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because. Everybody say because. You see, if you're in a place, there's got to be a because. If you're stuck somewhere not good, if you're hanging around the manure pile, there's got to become a because. And you got to get out of it again. Or you got to, the first time, you got to get out of it. Sarah was able to get out of not having a child because. What did she do? Because she counted God faithful. Remember, she, had, she, she was at the tent. God was outside. How cool is that? And how, come on, how cool is that? Other times, Abram had told her what God said. And she was never able to grab a hold of it. Because somebody else, even though it was her husband, all the other times he told her. But this time she heard it for herself. And at first she found it funny in a bad way. And she's like, it's too late. And I'm not playing this game. And we're done. And she laughed and laughed it off. And then when God said, why'd you laugh? Then she lied. Really in trouble. But there had to be, because how many of you know it takes nine months to have a baby? Right? In that three-month period, it'll take forever. In that three-month period, she went from calling God uh, 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 to laughing at God and lying to God to counting him faithful. There's got to be a point that if you need something, if something's holding you back from being everything God wants you to be, from being the deliverer, deliverer that Gideon was, to being when you hear King David, what do you think of? I always think of a man after God's own heart. When I think of Abraham, I don't think of Rahab. That's not my first thought. The first thought I, I think of is I'm in the family because of him. And, and I'm in line for what he had because I, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm in that same line. That's what I think of when I think of Abraham. I don't think of his faults. I don't know if you do, but I don't. All I know is he had them. And the same thing about you. God doesn't, how many of you know if you've repented, if the blood of Jesus has cleansed you, that God don't think about it either. Now people around you, oh, they think about it. Especially if you've done something to them, they might think about it. But, you know, as I say it like this, I heard it said this one time, if you go to start talking to God about your past all the time, he might say to you, what? Why? Because if you really repented, he remembers your sin no more. It's as far as the east is from the west. But so that's where you got to live. But, but, but you can't live in and practice sin and expect God's highest and best. Are you with me? So there had to be a because. Sarah had to have a because. Well, let's look at this. Um, Let's look at Moses real quick. Let's look at Hebrews eleven twenty seven. I'm not going to keep you too long tonight. I just, want to, I just want to encourage you. God needs you right now. We're coming out of the wilderness. He needs his ministers of reconciliation ready. He needs you ready at a moment's notice to do his bidding, to talk to people, to lay hands on the sick, to help them. He needs you. I, I need you to be in a receiving gear, but I need you in a go gear. I need you to want to take care of the things and receive faith, uh, you know, have faith to receive whatever God has. But I also need you in a go gear. It, it's time. No, it's really past time. Jesus is coming back. Come on. How many people do we want to have to go to hell on our watch? Uh, let's be blunt with you. When I see the number 500,000 Americans died, I don't think, oh, that's awful. I think how many went to hell? I used to not think that way. How many of those went to hell in America, in the USA, while we're fussing over everything else, yet eternity, someone went to hell when they didn't have to? Well, they, we, if we'd have had the right man, no, people are going to die. People are coming and going on the earth all the time. You can't stop that. But what we can't stop is people going to hell. Right? So God needs us. Amen. He needs you. Yes, Pastor Mark, you need, to get, you need to get busy. No, you need to get busy. I'm already busy. 
My job is the harvest, but my job is to prepare you for the harvest. That's, that's, this is saturation. We turned around. We had a good time. Hallelujah. The Lord's trying to motivate you to get ready. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. He'll use you, though, but there's got to be a because in your life. Let's look at Hebrews eleven twenty-seven. 27. By faith, it's talking about Moses, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, this is not just any king. This is grandpa. This is grandpa. He's adopted into the family of Pharaoh. This is grandpa. It's a little harder to, to mess with a king, but it's even harder to mess with grandpa. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him. What happened? Because he quit looking in the natural realm and looked to somebody who couldn't see. Because remember, he was afraid. He knew his call. There's something inside of every one of us. You don't have to be Moses, but there's something you know you're supposed to be doing because it comes out in various ways. When he saw that Egyptian um, uh, terrorize the Israelite, the slave, what did he do? Something rose up within him and he killed the Egyptian. Why? Because there's a deliverer on the inside of him. He just did it wrong. He did it out of season. He tried to do it with his own hands. And, and, and then, you know, and then, then he tried to bury him and cover it up. Local news, Pharaoh's grandson, murderer. But he, and then, he, in some ways, though, he didn't even understand that he was doing wrong. Because the next day, he thought the Israelites would be like, hey, there's our buddy Moses. But they didn't. They disdained him. Who made you? <laughs> Ruler over us. Who are you? I don't need your help. So then what did he do? He ran away. Got married. God appears. What happens though? He came to a place of faith because even though he saw the fire, that wasn't enough. He had to get to a place where he saw the invisible one. He had to have a relationship. In other words, he counted God faithful. Because I know him. Seeing the invisible one. We could go backwards, and I think we will. Because I love this about King David. Remember how the prophet came to him and told him what was up? You know, gave him the sheep story. Y'all remember that? This, this guy, this guy, this big guy farmer had all these sheep and there was one guy who had one little sheep and the big guy stole the little sheep and, and he said, what should be done to that sheep? And he pronounced his own judgment. He's like, whoever that is, we're going to get him. We are, we are going to get him. And then what the prophets say? You're the man. You just pronounce judgment on yourself. Well, look at this. Let me find it. Got you all there, and then I'm not there. Second Samuel 12, 7. And Nathan said to David, you're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives to be your bosom. I gave you the house of Israel, of Judah. And if that was too little, I would have given, I, moreover, I would have given you these such and such. Th In other words, I'd have given you anything you asked for. Whereof how you despise the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. And you have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore... The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and you've taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be. Ooh, that's a lot. Um, and there's some things that happen, but verse 13 is the most important one. Because you know what? He could have said, well, fine. You said what you said. Whatever. But verse 13, and David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord has put away the sin. You will not die. And then he told him what was going to happen. 
But this is what I like about David. He said, well, the child that she's carrying, and this is Old Covenant, y'all. She's gonna die, he's going to die. But David and God had such a relationship that he decided to fight for that child anyway. In other words, he had such, this is, he's known God since being a shepherd. He's known God since he fought Goliath. He's known God um, when they were all gathered together in the cave of Adullam. He's known God in victory after victory after victory. He's seen God work throughout his life. So he knows him, and he knows he's merciful and kind. And so remember, he fasted and he prayed. And anyway, you know, the account, the son did pass away. And remember what David did? This is a man of faith. This is big stuff. Because he was fasting and praying, wouldn't eat, wouldn't sleep, prayed and prayed and prayed. Perhaps God would change his mind out of the pronouncement because of his sin. And what did he do? When he found out the child died, he did, he did what? He got up, took a shower, said, get me some food. And they're like, what in the world? Now's when you should be grieving. Basically, he said, I tried, um, but the child is in my future. He said, he can't come to me, but one day I'll go to him. <laughs> come on, that helps. Everybody's in our future. Any loved one who loved Jesus, who's born again, they're in our future. They're not in your past. Amen. They're in your future. Yes. But what I like about it is because he repented. So there's got to be a because. There's got to be a because. Peter, again, the Lord, you know, dealt with him. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? The Lord is so kind. Remember, I've taught you on this. You know, do you agape me? Feed my sheep. Do you agape me? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. And he's like, you know it. And then he says, do you phileo me? In other words, that's where Peter was feeling so down, so disheartened, that the Lord even came down a level on the love walk o meter to meet him. And then something happened there. When he received the love of God, he must have repented. Because the next thing we see, he's up on the day of Pentecost. And they're not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. And they're rocking and reeling down in the streets of Jerusalem. And then he boldly, the one who, who denied Jesus three times, cock a doodle doo, now he's up doing what? He's like, he's like this is that, which was prophesied by Joel. An outpouring of the Spirit. An outpour you see, his repentance, his being positioned, got him ready for something that was ordained, and that was an outpouring. And I'm telling you, we are ready for an outpouring. Amen. The Lord is positioning us. But you know what? He wants to use you. The living water comes up out of you. Come on, it's time. It's time. I could just go on and on and on because there's so many of them. But you get the point. You, you don't have to be perfect. But he lifted you up out of a dunghill. I said he lifted you up out of a dunghill to set you with the princes, even the princes of his people. Amen. And it's time for us to mobilize and, and uh, for us to get ready for what God has. But I, I, I guess I need you to, to forget the former things. I need you to be ready. The Lord needs you to be ready. Because he's ready to use you. And if you think, well, I got to do this and I got to do that. No, what you got to be is ready. What you got to do is, is walk in forgiveness, walk in freedom. You know, that's why this song right now, uh, he picked me up. He turned me around, set my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the Savior. Why it does something is because I, I, I sense it. It's like the prodigal's coming home. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a cry that's going to come from people, and they're going to be so grateful. But you have an opportunity to be a part of it. Come on. You know what's addictive? I know drugs are, but you know what's something else that's addictive? You know something else? Getting people born again. Bringing people to church. Seeing them get saved. Seeing them come back to God. Seeing marriages restored, seeing bodies healed, that's addictive. That's addictive. You start seeing that and being a part of that, it, it'll get off on you. Who, next? I mean, you know, you'll want, somebody, you'll want to find somebody. Are, are you with me?